Hi, I'm Antonio Martin Carrillo, an astrophysics lecturer at UCD. Today, I'm going to be talking about astrophysics and how it is connected to many different areas of physics and other sciences such as biology, chemistry, and geology. Personally, I've always wanted to be an astrophysicist and one of the reasons is precisely because studying astrophysics or working in this area allows me to interact with so many other aspects of science. Unlike biology, chemistry, or other areas of physics, astrophysics cannot control the lab. Our experiments depend on what the sky is showing us at that moment. Uh, but however, I personally feel that that is also part of the fun. It's like playing detective, but making it a bit more challenging since you cannot move to the scene of the crime. The good news is that this kind of a sky lab is really vast, rich on stars galaxies and nebulae, and therefore, after years of investigation, collecting data and discoveries, we have managed to start getting solid answers to some of our questions. Probably one of the most common questions that we ask ourselves is, how did we get here? This question is a very good example of what I mentioned earlier about the connection between astrophysics and other disciplines. To answer it, we will need to cover aspects of chemistry, particle physics, nuclear physics, spectroscopy, and relativity, among others. Let's have a look at the periodic table of elements. These are all the known elements that make up the universe. From the simplest of all, hydrogen, to more complex ones like gold, platinum, or lead. If we look at the composition of the universe, we realize that the most common element in the entire universe is hydrogen, followed by helium. When the universe began with the Big Bang, these two were the only elements in the universe, the building blocks of everything else. One would expect that if hydrogen is so common, we should be able to detect it almost everywhere. And we do. Let's have a look at this image of the Horsehead Nebula. At the red, you can see here is hydrogen lit up by the blue light of those bright stars that you can see in the image. As shown here, what is happening is that the blue light is exciting the electron, that is, making the electron jump from its normal orbit to a higher one. When doing this, the atoms and molecules of hydrogen are absorbing the blue light of the stars. After a while, the electron moves back to its normal level. While it does that, it emits light. In this particular case, the light emitted is very specific and it's mostly in the red part of the rainbow. These emissions can be seen in multiple areas of our galaxy, like here in the Horsehead Nebula, and in other galaxies, like these two that you can see here. All the red or pinkish points on the galaxy on the right would be an area with high concentration of hydrogen. These regions are not only important to show that hydrogen is very abundant, they are also birthplaces for hundreds or thousands of new stars. So a galaxy with loads of red areas is telling us that it's very active in star formation. Now, remember that our goal is to know how we got here. So it seems natural to ask how the universe went from only hydrogen and helium to having heavier, more complex elements. You can see that even though the heavier elements, oxygen, carbon, aluminium, calcium, only make up a tiny fraction of the universe. They are the ones that dominate our planet and our life. So knowing how they were and are being produced is crucial to find the answer to our main question. Stars are powered by nuclear fusion reactions. For most of their lives, this reaction converts hydrogen into helium. Let's have a closer look at this reaction. We start with two hydrogen atoms that interact to form something called deuterium. In the mix, they also produce a positron, an electron with positive charge, and a particle called neutrino. 
If the deuterium encounters another hydrogen atom, it will produce energy and helium-3, which will try to find another helium-3 quickly to produce more energy, the stable helium atom, and two hydrogen atoms. The fact that during the process we regenerate two hydrogen atoms make this reaction last billions of years. In the process of converting hydrogen into helium, the stars are not consuming all its fuel, but they are being capable of refilling themselves. It's like if a car, while in motion, will be able to generate a little bit of gasoline while consuming it. Our journey could last much longer than if it was just consuming gasoline. As more and more helium is produced, the start will start to change and at some point its core will consist mostly of helium. At that point, a new set of reactions will kick off, converting helium into carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. For a star like our sun, at the end of its life, its interior would look like more or less like an onion with different layers of different elements. Heavier elements will be located closer to the core, with the initial hydro hydrogen and helium on the other layers. When it dies, the other layers will be ejected, depositing mostly the hydrogen and helium back into the galaxy. However, it will also eject a little bit of carbon, nitrogen and oxygen, enriching the chemical composition of the galaxy. If instead of a normal star, we look at the interior of a massive star before it dies, we notice that due to its heavier internal pressure at its core, it has been capable of producing elements up to iron in the periodic table. When the star's core is made of iron, the core becomes inactive. The star is not capable of doing nuclear fusion on iron, and the star dies very violently and what we call a supernova. Sometimes, if the conditions are right, an even more violent event known as gamma ray burst is produced. These are the most violent explosions in the universe since the Big Bang and can produce in a matter of seconds as much energy as the sun would do in three lifetimes. During the explosion, all the elements created by the star will go back to the environment of the galaxy, enriching even more than in the cases of normal stars. While this can explain why carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, silicon are among the most common heavy elements, as you can see on, on these pie charts, it still fails at explaining the origin of all the other elements in the periodic table. Going back to the periodic table, we can explain it all the way to iron, but we know that the periodic table is much richer, so we need to investigate farther. The problem is that to generate heavier elements than iron, we need a process on which we can capture loads of neutrons very quickly so we can build up elements before the reaction becomes inefficient and we get stuck without producing, producing them. This process is known as R process and as you can see here, it's very explosive, creating heavy elements, those with higher number of neutrons and protons at their core, in fractions of seconds. Luckily, one type of remnant from the death of massive stars gives us the perfect scenario for something like this, neutron stars. Neutron stars are formed when stars are about eight times the mass of the sun and they die. While most of the mass from the original star is ejected, about one time the mass of the sun is kept on, those, on these super dense objects with sizes of a city and temperatures of millions of degrees. Here we can see the size of, of the neutron star compared to New York. The objects are so dense that relativistic effects, relativistic effects are strong enough for us to measure them. In 2017, we had the opportunity of detecting for the first time two neutron stars orbiting each other and finally merging. Like people moving in the water or a pebble falling into a puddle, the neutron stars disturbed the space-time, creating waves, ripples that expanded and traveled all the way to us. This animation 
shows how we understand that this process took place using our most updated theories, combining gravitational waves and light. The system was observed at an angle and the jet didn't hit us directly. This allowed us to see things that otherwise would have probably been masked by other physical processes. While the observed gamma ray radiation was very, very important to prove that some type of gamma ray burst can be created during the merging of neutron stars, the optical light showed evidence of the R process capable of producing the majority of the heavier elements of the periodic table. Everything you see here in yellow is produced during the merger of two neutron stars. Most of the gold, silver that you could have at home and that exists in the universe has been created by multiple events like this, by merging neutron stars. If we look at the composition of our solar system, we see that it is mostly made by hydrogen and helium as expected. It is that 2% remaining that is used to form the rocky planets, our atmosphere, as. On Earth, we can find everything in the periodic table, from oxygen to silver, gold, platinum. The reason why we can find them here is because of over billions of years, evolution of our galaxy, the evolution of our universe, stars have been born and died. New stars have recycled some of the materials left from the previous generation and continue from there enriching more and more the galaxy with different elements until this point. Thanks to our lab in the sky, we can understand the origin of everything that surrounds us and that after years of techno technological advancement, we have managed to adapt to our needs to reach the lifestyle that we have today. Silicon on our microchips, gold, silver in our jewelry, and many more examples. I hope that you enjoy this, this talk. Thank you very much for your attention and have a good day. Bye.